Psycho by Robert Block Chapter 1 Norman Bates heard the noise and a shock went through him. It sounded as though somebody was tapping on the window pane. He looked up hastily, half prepared to rise, and the book slid from his hands to his ample lap. Then he realized that the sound was merely rain. Late afternoon rain, striking the parlor window. Norman hadn't noticed the coming of the rain, nor the twilight. But it was quite dim here in the parlor now, and he reached over to switch on the lamp before resuming his reading. It was one of those old-fashioned table lamps, the kind with the ornate glass shade and the crystal fringe. Mother had had it ever since he could remember, and she refused to get rid of it. Norman didn't really object. He had lived in this house for all of the 40 years of his life, and there was something quite pleasant and reassuring about being surrounded by familiar things. Here, everything was orderly and ordained. It was only there, outside, that the changes took place, and most of those changes held a potential threat. Suppose he had spent the afternoon walking, for example. He might have been off on some lonely side road or even in the swamps when the rain came. And then what? He'd be soaked to the skin, forced to stumble along home in the dark. You could catch your death of cold that way. And besides, who wanted to be out in the dark? It was much nicer here in the parlor, under the lamp, with a good book for company. The light shone down on his plump face, reflected from his rimless glasses, bathed the pinkness of his scalp beneath the thinning sandy hair as he bent his head to resume reading. It was really a fascinating book. No wonder he hadn't noticed how fast the time had passed. It was The Realm of the Incas by Victor W. Von Hagen, and Norman had never before encountered such a wealth of curious information. For example, this description of the Kachna, or victory dance, where the warriors formed a great circle, moving and writhing like a snake. He read, The drumbeat for this was usually performed on what had been the body of an enemy. The skin had been flayed, and the belly stretched to form a drum, and the whole body acted as a sound box while throbbings came out of the open mouth. Grotesque, but effective. Norman smiled, then allowed himself the luxury of a comfortable shiver. Grotesque, but effective. It certainly must have been. Imagine flaying a man, alive probably, and then stretching his belly to use it as a drum. How did they actually go about doing that, curing and preserving the flesh of the corpse to prevent decay? For that matter, what kind of a mentality did it take to conceive of such an idea in the first place? It wasn't the most appetizing notion in the world, but when Norman half closed his eyes, he could almost see the scene. This throng of painted naked warriors wriggling and swaying in unison under a sun-drenched savage sky, and the old crone crouching before them, throbbing out a relentless rhythm on the swollen, distended belly of a cadaver. The contorted mouth of the corpse would be forced open, probably fixed in a gaping grimace by clamps of bone, and from it the sound emerged, beating from the belly, rising through the shrunken inner orifices, forced up through the withered windpipe to emerge amplified and in full force from the dead throat. For a moment, Norman could almost hear it, and then he remembered that rain has its rhythm too, and footsteps. Actually, he was aware of the footsteps without even hearing them. Long familiarity aided his senses whenever Mother came into the room. He didn't even have to look up to know she was there. In fact, he didn't look up. He pretended to continue his reading instead. Mother had been sleeping in her room, and he knew how crabby she could get when just awakened. So it was best to keep quiet and hope that she wasn't in one of her bad moods. Norman, do you know what time it is? He sighed and closed the book. He could tell now that she was going to be difficult. The very question was a challenge. Mother had to pass the grandfather clock in the hall in order to come in here, and she could easily see what time it was. Still, no sense making an issue of it. Norman glanced down at his wristwatch, then smiled. A little after five, he said. I actually didn't realize it was so late. I've been reading. Don't you think I have eyes? I can see what you've been doing. She was over at the window now, staring out at the rain. And I can see what you haven't been doing, too. Why didn't you turn the sign on when it got dark? And why aren't you up at the office where you belong? Well, it started to rain so hard and I didn't expect there'd be any traffic in this kind of weather. Nonsense! 
That's just the time you're likely to get some business. Lots of folks don't care to drive when it's raining. But it isn't likely anybody would be coming this way. Everyone takes the new highway. Norman heard the bitterness creeping into his voice, felt it welling up into his throat until he could taste it and tried to hold it back. But too late now, he had to vomit it out. I told you how it would be at the time when we got that advance tip that they were moving the highway. You could have sold the motel then, before there was a public announcement about the new road coming through. We could have bought all kinds of land over there for a song, closer to Fairvale, too. We'd have had a new motel, a new house, made some money. But you wouldn't listen. You never listen to me, do you? It's always what you want and what you think. You make me sick. Do I, boy? Mother's voice was deceptively gentle, but that didn't fool Norman. Not when she called him boy. Forty years old, and she called him boy. That's how she treated him, too, which made it worse. If only he didn't have to listen. But he did. He knew he had to. He always had to listen. Do I, boy? She repeated, even more softly. I make you sick, eh? Well, I think not. No, boy, I don't make you sick. You make yourself sick. That's the real reason you're still sitting over here on this side road, isn't it, Norman? Because the truth is that you haven't any gumption. Never had any gumption, did you, boy? Never had the gumption to leave home. Never had the gumption to go out and get yourself a job or join the army or even find yourself a girl. You wouldn't let me. That's right, Norman. I wouldn't let you. But if you were half a man, you'd have gone your own way. He wanted to shout out at her that she was wrong, but he couldn't. Because the things she was saying were the things he had told himself over and over again all through the years. It was true. She'd always laid down the law to him, but that didn't mean he always had to obey. Mothers sometimes are overly possessive, but not all children allow themselves to be possessed. There had been other widows, other only sons, and not all of them became enmeshed in this sort of relationship. It was really his fault as much as hers, because he didn't have any gumption. You could have insisted, you know, she was saying. Suppose you'd gone out and found us a new location, then put the place here up for sale. But no, all you did was whine, and I know why. You never fooled me for an instant. It's because you really didn't want to move. You've never wanted to leave this place, and you never will now, ever. You can't leave, can you? Any more than you can grow up. He couldn't look at her. Not when she said things like that, he couldn't. And there was nowhere else for him to look either. The beaded lamp, the heavy old overstuffed furniture, all the familiar objects in the room suddenly became hateful just because of long familiarity, like the furnishings of a prison cell. He stared out of the window, but that was no good either. Out there was the wind and the rain and the darkness. He knew there was no escape for him out there. No escape anywhere from the voice that throbbed, the voice that drummed into his ears like that of the Inca corpse in the book, the drum of the dead. He clutched at the book now and tried to focus his eyes on it. Maybe if he ignored her and pretended to be calm, but it didn't work. Look at yourself, she was saying, the drum going boom, 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 and the sound reverberating from the mangled mouth. I know why you didn't bother to switch on the sign. I know why you haven't even gone up to open the office tonight. You didn't really forget. It's just that you don't want anyone to come. You hope they don't come. All right, he muttered. I admit it. I hate running a motel. Always have. It's more than that, boy. There it was again. Boy, boy, boy. Drumming away, out of the jaws of death. You hate people. Because really you're afraid of them, aren't you? Always have been, ever since you were a little tyke. Rather snuggle up in a chair under the lamp and read. You did it 30 years ago, and you're still doing it now, hiding away under the covers of a book. There's a lot worse things I could be doing. You always told me that yourself. At least I never went out and got into trouble. Isn't it better to improve my mind? Improve your mind? Ha! Huh. He could sense her standing behind him now, staring down. Call that improvement? You don't fool me, boy, not for a minute. Never have. It isn't as if you were reading the Bible or even trying to get an education. I know the sort of thing you read, trash, and worse than trash. This happens to be a history of the Inca civilization. I'll just bet it is. 
and I'll just bet it's crammed full with nasty bits about those dirty savages, like the one you had about the South Seas. Oh, you didn't think I knew about that one, did you? Hiding it up in your room, the way you hid all the others, those filthy things you used to read? Psychology isn't filthy, mother. Psychology, he calls it. A lot you know about psychology. I'll never forget that time you talked so dirty to me. Never. To think that a son could come to his own mother and say such things. But I was only trying to explain something. It's what they call the Oedipus situation. And I thought if both of us could just look at the problem reasonably and try to understand it, maybe things would change for the better. Change, boy? Nothing's going to change. You can read all the books in the world and you'll still be the same. I don't need to listen to a lot of veal obscene rigmarole to know what you are. Why? Even an eight-year-old child could recognize it. They did too. All your little playmates did, way back then. You're a mama's boy. That's what they called you, and that's what you were. Were, are, and always will be. A big, fat, overgrown mama's boy. It was deafening him, the drumbeat of her words, the drumbeat in his own chest. The vileness in his mouth made him choke. In a moment, he'd have to cry. Norman shook his head, to think that she could still do this to him, even now. But she could, and she was, and she would, over and over again, unless, unless what? God, could she read his mind? I know what you're thinking, Norman. I know all about you, boy, more than you dream. But I know that, too, what you dream. You're thinking that you'd like to kill me, aren't you, Norman? But you can't, because you haven't the gumption. I'm the one who has the strength. I've always had it. Enough for both of us. That's why you'll never get rid of me, even if you really wanted to. Of course, deep down you don't want to. You need me, boy. That's the truth, isn't it? Norman stood up slowly. He didn't dare trust himself to turn and face her. Not yet. He had to tell himself to be calm first. Be very, very calm. Don't think about what she's saying. Try to face up to it. Try to remember. She's an old woman and not quite a right in the heed. If you keep on listening to her this way, you'll end up not quite right in the head either. Tell her to go back to her room and lie down. That's where she belongs. And she'd better go there fast, because if she doesn't, this time you're going to strangle her with her own silver cord. He started to swing around, his mouth working, framing the phrases when the buzzer sounded. That was the signal. It meant somebody had driven in, up at the motel, and was ringing for service. Without even bothering to look back, Norman walked into the hall, took his raincoat from the hangar, and went out into the darkness. Chapter 2 The rain had been falling steadily for several minutes before Mary noticed it and switched on the windshield wiper. At the same time, she put on the headlights. It had gotten dark quite suddenly, and the road ahead was only a vague blur between the towering trees. Trees? She couldn't recall a stretch of trees along here the last time she'd driven this way. Of course, that had been the previous summer and she'd come into Fairvale in broad daylight, alert and refreshed. Now, she was tired out from 18 hours of steady driving, but she could still remember and sense that something was wrong. Remember, that was the trigger word. Now she could remember, dimly, how she'd hesitated back there about a half hour ago when she came to the fork in the road. That was it. She'd taken the wrong turn, and now here she was, God knows where, with this rain coming down and everything pitch black outside. Get a grip on yourself now. You can't afford to be panicky. The worst part of it was over. It was true, she told herself. The worst part was over. The worst part had come yesterday afternoon, when she stole the money. She had been standing in Mr. Lowery's office, when old Tommy Cassidy hauled out that big green bundle of bills and put them down on the desk. Thirty-six Federal Reserve notes bearing the picture of the fat man who looked like a wholesale grocer, and eight more carrying the face of the man who looked like an undertaker. But the wholesale grocer was Grover Cleveland, and the undertaker was William McKinley, and thirty-six thousands and eight five hundreds added up to forty thousand dollars. Tommy Cassidy had put them down just like that, fanning them casually as he announced he was closing the deal and buying a house as his daughter's wedding present. 
Mr. Lowry pretended to be just as casual as he went through the business of signing the final papers. But after old Tommy Cassidy went away, Mr. Lowry got a little bit excited. He scooped up the money, put it into a big brown manila number 10 envelope, and sealed the flap. Mary noticed how his hands were trembling. Here, he said, handing her the money. Take it over to the bank. It's almost four o'clock, but I'm sure Gilbert will let you make a deposit. He paused, staring at her. What's the matter, Miss Crane? Don't you feel well? Maybe he had noticed the way her hands trembled now that she was holding the envelope. But it didn't matter. She knew what she was going to say, even though she was surprised when she found herself actually saying it. I seem to have one of my headaches, Mr. Lowry. As a matter of fact, I was just going to ask if it was all right if I took the rest of the afternoon off. We're all caught up on the mail, and we can't make out the rest of the forms on this deal until Monday. Mr. Lowry smiled at her. He was in good humor, and why shouldn't he be? 5% of 40000 was $2,000. He could afford to be generous. Of course, Miss Crane. You just make this deposit and then run along Bourne. Would you like me to drive you? No, that's all right. I can manage. A little rest. That's the ticket. See you Monday, then. Take it easy. That's what I always say. In a pig's ear, that's what he always said. Lowry would half kill himself to make an extra dollar, and he'd be perfectly willing to kill any of his employees for another 50 cents. But Mary Crane had smiled at him very sweetly then walked out of his office and out of his life. Taking the $40,000 with her, you don't get that kind of an opportunity every day of your life. In fact, when you come right down to it, some people don't seem to get any opportunities at all. Mary Crane had waited over 27 years for hers. The opportunity to go on to college had vanished at 17 when Daddy was hit by a car. Mary went to business school for a year instead and then settled down to support mom and her kid sister, Lila. The opportunity to marry disappeared at 22, when Dale Belter was called up to serve his hitch in the army. Pretty soon, he was stationed in Hawaii, and before long, he began mentioning this girl in his letters, and then the letters stopped coming. When she finally got the wedding announcement, she didn't care anymore. Besides, mom was pretty sick by then. It took her three years to die while Lila was off at school. Mary had insisted she go to college, come what may, but that left her carrying the whole load. Between holding down a job at the Lowry Agency all day and sitting up with mom half the night, there wasn't time for anything else, not even time to note the passing of time. But then mom had the final stroke, and there was the business of the funeral, and Lila coming back from school and trying to find a job, and all at once there was Mary Crane looking at herself in the big mirror and seeing this drawn, contorted face peering back at her, she'd thrown something at the mirror, and then the mirror broke into a thousand pieces, and she knew that wasn't all. She was breaking into a thousand pieces, too. Lila had been wonderful, and even Mr. Lowry helped out by seeing to it that the house was sold right away. By the time the estate was settled, they had about $2,000 in cash left over. Lila got a job in a record shop downtown and they moved into a small apartment together. Now, you're going to take a vacation, Lila told her. A real vacation. No, don't argue about it. You've kept this family going for eight years, and it's about time you had a rest. I want you to take a trip, a cruise, maybe. So Mary took the SS Caledonia, and after a week or so in Caribbean, Waters, the drawn, contorted face, had disappeared from the mirror of her stateroom. She looked like a young girl again, well, certainly not a day over 22, she told herself, and, what was more important still, a young girl in love. It wasn't the wild, surging thing it had been when she met Dale Belter. It wasn't even the usual stereotype of moonlight on the water, generally associated with a tropical cruise. Sam Loomis was a good ten years older than Dale Belter had been, and pretty much on the quiet side, but she loved him. It looked like the first real opportunity of all, until Sam explained a few things. I'm really sailing under false pretenses, you might say, he told her. There's this hardware store, you see. Then the story came out. There was this hardware store in a little town called Fairvale, up north. Sam had worked there for his father, 
with the understanding that he'd inherit the business. A year ago, his father had died, and the accountants had told him the bad news. Sam inherited the business, all right, plus about 20000 in debts. The building was mortgaged, the inventory was mortgaged, and even the insurance had been mortgaged. Sam's father had never told him about his little side investments in the market or the racetrack, but there it was. There were only two choices, go into bankruptcy or try and work off the obligations. Sam Loomis chose the latter course. It's a good business, he explained. I'll never make a fortune, but with any kind of decent management, there's a steady eight or 10,000 a year to be made. And if I can work up a decent line of farm machinery, maybe even more, got over 4,000 paid off already. I figure another couple of years and I'll be clear. But I don't understand. If you're in debt, then how can you afford to take a trip like this? Sam grinned at her. I won it in a contest. That's right. A dealer's sales contest sponsored by one of these farm machinery outfits. I wasn't trying to win a trip at all, just hustling to pay off creditors, but they notified me I'd copped first prize in my territory. I tried to settle for a cash deal instead, but they wouldn't go for it, trip or nothing. Well, this is a slack month, and I've got an honest clerk working for me. I figured I might as well take a free vacation, so here I am, and here you are. He grinned, then sighed. I wish it was our honeymoon. Sam, why couldn't it be? I mean, but he sighed again and shook his head. We'll have to wait. It may take two, three years before everything is paid off. I don't want to wait. I don't care about the money. I could quit my job, work in your store, and sleep in it too, the way I do. He managed to grin again, but it was no more cheerful than the sigh. That's right. Rigged up a place for myself in the back room. I'm living on baked beans most of the time. Folks say I'm tighter than the town banker. But what's the point? Mary asked. I mean, if you lived decently, it would only take a year or so longer to pay off what you owe. And meanwhile, meanwhile, I have to live in Fairvale. It's a nice town, but a small one. Everybody knows everybody else's business. As long as I'm in their pitching, I've got their respect. They go out of their way to trade with me. They all know the situation and appreciate I'm trying to do my best. Dad had a good reputation in spite of the way things turned out. I want to keep that for myself and for the business and for us in the future. Now that's more important than ever, don't you see? The future? Mary sighed. Two or three years, you said. I'm sorry. But when we get married, I want us to have a decent home, nice things. That costs money. At least you need credit. As it is, I'm stretching payments with suppliers all down the line. They'll play ball as long as they know everything I make goes toward paying off what I owe them. It isn't easy, and it isn't pleasant, but I know what I want, and I can't settle for less. So you'll just have to be patient, darling. So she was patient, but not until she learned that no amount of further persuasion, verbal or physical, would sway him. There the situation stood when the cruise ended and there it had remained for well over a year. Mary had driven up to visit him last summer. She saw the town, the store, the fresh figures in the ledger, which showed that Sam had paid off an additional $5,000. Only 11,000 to go, he told her proudly. Another two years, maybe even less. Two years, in two years she'd be 29. She couldn't afford to pull a bluff, stage a scene, and walk out on him like some young girl of 20. She knew there wouldn't be many more Sam Loomises in her life. So she smiled and nodded and went back home to the Lowry Agency. She went back to the Lowry Agency and watched old man Lowry take his steady 5% on every sale he made. She watched him buy up shaky mortgages and foreclose, watched him make quick, cunning, cutthroat cash offers to desperate sellers, and then turn around and take a fat profit on a fast, easy resale. People were always buying, always selling. All Lowry did was stand in the middle, extracting a percentage from both parties just for bringing buyer and seller together. He performed no other real service to justify his existence, and yet he was rich. It wouldn't take him two years to sweat out an $11,000 debt. He could sometimes make as much in two months. Mary hated him, and she hated a lot of the buyers and sellers he did business with because they were rich, too. This Tommy Cassidy was one of the worst, a big operator, 
loaded with money from oil leases. He didn't have to turn a hand, but he was always dabbling in real estate, sniffing the scent of somebody's fear or want, bidding low and selling high, alert to every possibility of squeezing out an extra dollar in rentals or income. He thought nothing of laying down $40,000 in cash to buy his daughter a home for a wedding present any more than he thought anything about laying down a $100 bill on Mary Crane's desk one afternoon about six months ago and suggesting she take a little trip with him down to Dallas for the weekend. It had all been done so quickly and with such a bland and casual smirk that she didn't have time to get angry. Then Mr. Lowry came in and the matter ended. She'd never told Cassidy off in public or in private, and he never repeated the offer, but she didn't forget. She couldn't forget the wet lip smile on his fat old face. And she never forgot that this world belonged to the Tommy Cassidys. They owned the property and they set the prices. $40,000 to a daughter for a wedding gift. $100 tossed carelessly on a desk for three days rental privileges of the body of Mary Crane. So I took the $40,000. That's the way the old gag went. But this hadn't been a gag. She did take the money. And subconsciously, she must have been daydreaming about just such an opportunity for a long, long time. Because now, everything seemed to fall into place, as though part of a preconceived plan. It was Friday afternoon. The banks would be closed tomorrow, and that meant Lowry wouldn't get around to checking on her activities until Monday, when she didn't show up at the office. Better still, Lila had departed early in the morning for Dallas. She did all the buying for the record shop now, and she wouldn't be back until Monday either. Mary drove right to the apartment and packed. Not everything, just her best clothes in the suitcase and the small overnight bag. She and Lila had $360 hidden away in an empty cold cream jar, but she didn't touch that. Lila would need it when she had to keep up the apartment alone. Mary wished that she could write her sister a note of some kind, but she didn't dare. It would be hard for Lila in the days ahead. Still, there was no help for it. Maybe something could be worked out later on. Mary left the apartment around seven. An hour later, she halted on the outskirts of a suburb and ate supper, then drove in under an OK used car sign and traded her sedan for a coupe. She lost money on the transaction, lost still more early the next morning when she repeated the performance in a town 400 miles north. Around noon, when she traded again, she found herself in possession of $30 in cash and a battered old heap with a crumpled left front fender but she was not displeased. The important thing was to make a number of fast switches, cover her trail, and wind up with a junker that would take her as far as Fairvale. Once there, she could drive further north, maybe as far as Springfield, and sell the last car under her name. How would the authorities trace down the whereabouts of a Mrs. Sam Loomis, living in a town a hundred miles from there? Because she intended to become Mrs. Sam Loomis, and quickly. She'd walk in on Sam with this story about coming into the inheritance. Not $40,000. That would be too large a sum and might require too much explanation. But maybe she'd say it was 15. And she'd tell him Lila had received an equal amount, quit her job abruptly, and gone off to Europe. That would explain why there was no sense inviting her to the wedding. Maybe Sam would balk about taking the money, and certainly there'd be a lot of awkward questions to answer, but she'd get around him. She'd have to. They'd be married at once. That was the important thing. She'd have his name then, Mrs. Sam Loomis, wife of the proprietor of a hardware store in a town 800 miles away from the Lowry Agency. The Lowry Agency didn't even know of Sam's existence. Of course they'd come to Lila, and she'd probably guess right away but Lila wouldn't say anything, not until she contacted Mary first. When that time came, Mary would have to be prepared to handle her sister, keep her quiet in front of Sam and the authorities. It shouldn't be too difficult. Lila owed her that much for all the years Mary had worked to send her through school. Perhaps she could even give her part of the remaining $25,000. Maybe she wouldn't take it, but there would be some solution. Mary hadn't planned that far ahead but when the time came, the answer would be ready. Right now she had to do one thing at a time, and the first step was to reach Fairvale. On the scale map, it was a distance of a mere four inches, four insignificant inches of red lines from one dot to another. 
But it had taken her 18 hours to get this far. 18 hours of endless vibration. 18 hours of peering and squinting in headlight glare and sunlight reflection. 18 hours of cramped contortion, of fighting the road and the wheel and the dulling, deadly onslaught of her own fatigue. Now she had missed her turn and it was raining. The night had come down and she was lost on a strange road. Mary glanced into the rearview mirror and caught a dim reflection of her face. The dark hair and the regular features were still familiar, but the smile had gone and her full lips were compressed to a taut line. Where had she seen that drawn, contorted countenance before? In the mirror after Mom died, when you went to pieces. And here, all along, she'd thought of herself as being so calm, so cool, so composed. There had been no consciousness of fear, of regret, of guilt. But the mirror didn't lie. It told her the truth now. It told her, wordlessly, to stop. You can't stumble into Sam's arms looking like this, coming out of the night with your face and clothing giving away the story of hasty flight. Sure, your story is that you wanted to surprise him with the good news, but you'll have to look as though you're so happy you couldn't wait. The thing to do was to stay over somewhere tonight get a decent rest, and arrive in Fairvale tomorrow morning, alert and refreshed. If she turned around and drove back to the place where she made the wrong turnoff, she'd hit the main highway again. Then she could find a motel. Mary nodded to herself, resisting the impulse to close her eyes, and then jerked erect, scanning the side of the road through the blur of rain-swept darkness. That's when she saw the sign, set beside the driveway which led to the small building off on the side. Motel. Vacancy. The sign was unlit, but maybe they'd forgotten to switch it on, just as she'd forgotten to put on her headlights when the night suddenly descended. Mary drove in, noting that the entire motel was dark, including the glass front cubicle on the end, which undoubtedly served as an office. Maybe the place was closed. She slowed down and peered in, then felt her tires roll over one of those electric signal cables. Now she could see the house on the hillside behind the motel. Its front windows were lighted, and probably the proprietor was up there. He'd come down in a moment. She switched off the ignition and waited. All at once she could hear the sullen patter of the rain and sense the sigh of the wind behind it. She remembered the sound because it had rained like that the day Mom was buried, the day they lowered her into that little rectangle of darkness. And now the darkness was here rising all around Mary. She was alone in the darkness. The money wouldn't help her, and Sam wouldn't help her, because she'd taken the wrong turn back there and she was on a strange road. But no help for it. She'd made her grave now, and now she must lie in it. Why did she think that? It wasn't grave. It was bed. She was still trying to puzzle it out when the big dark shadow emerged out of the other shadows and opened her car door. Chapter 3 Looking for a room? Mary made up her mind very quickly once she saw the fat, bespectacled face and heard the soft, hesitant voice. There wouldn't be any trouble. She nodded and climbed out of the car, feeling the ache in her calves as she followed him to the door of the office. He unlocked it, stepped inside the cubicle, and switched on the light. Sorry I didn't get down sooner. I've been up at the house. Mother isn't very well. There was nothing distinctive about the office, but it was warm and dry and bright. Mary shivered gratefully and smiled up at the fat man. He bent over the ledger on the counter. Our rooms are seven dollars single. Would you like to take a look first? That won't be necessary. She opened her purse quickly, extracting a five dollar bill and two singles and placing them on the counter as he pushed the register forward and held out a pen. For a moment she hesitated then wrote a name, Jane Wilson, and an address, San Antonio, Texas. She couldn't very well do anything about the Texas plates on the car. I'll get your bags, he said, and came around the counter. She followed him outside again. The money was in the glove compartment, still in the same big envelope secured by the heavy rubber band. Maybe the best thing to do was to leave it there. She'd lock the car, and nobody would disturb it. He carried the bags over to the door of the room next to the office. It was the closest, and she didn't mind. The main thing was to get out of the rain. 
nasty weather, he said, standing aside as she entered. Have you been driving long? All day. He pressed a switch and the bedside lamp blossomed and sent forth yellow petals of light. The room was plainly but adequately furnished. She noted the shower stall in the bathroom beyond. Actually, she would have preferred a tub, but this would do. Everything all right? She nodded quickly, then remembered something. Is there anywhere around here where I can get a bite to eat? Well, let's see now. There used to be a root beer and hamburger stand up the road here about three miles, but I guess it's closed down now since the new highway came in. No, your best bet would be Fairvale. How far away is that? About 17, 18 miles. You keep going up the road until you come to a county trunk, turn right, and hit the main highway again. It's 10 miles straight ahead then. I'm surprised you didn't go through that way if you're heading north. I got lost. The fat man nodded and sighed. I thought as much. We don't get much regular traffic along here anymore since that new road opened. She smiled absently. He stood in the doorway, pursing his lips. When she looked up to meet his stare, he dropped his eyes and cleared his throat apologetically. Uh, miss, I was just thinking. Maybe you don't feel like driving all the way up to Fairvale and back in this rain. I mean, I was just going to fix a little snack for myself up at the house. You'd be perfectly welcome to join me. Oh, I couldn't do that. Why not? No trouble at all. Mother's gone back to bed and she won't be doing any cooking. I was only going to set out some cold cuts and make some coffee, if that's all right with you. Well, look, I'll just run along and get things ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Bates, Norman Bates. He backed against the door, bumping his shoulder. Look, I'll leave you this flashlight for when you come up. You probably want to get out of those wet things first. He turned away, but not before she caught a glimmer of his reddened face. Why? He was actually embarrassed. For the first time in almost 20 hours, a smile came to Mary Crane's face. She waited until the door closed behind him and then slipped out of her jacket. She opened her overnight bag on the bed and took out a print dress. She let it hang, hoping some of the wrinkles would disappear while she used the bathroom facilities. Just time to freshen up a bit now, but when she came back, she promised herself a good hot shower. That's what she needed. That and sleep. But first, a little food. Let's see now. Her makeup was in her purse, and she could wear the blue coat from the big suitcase. Fifteen minutes later, she was knocking on the door of the big frame house on the hillside. A single lamp shone from the unshaded parlor window, but a brighter reflection blazed from upstairs. If his mother was ill, that's where she'd be. Mary stood there, waiting for a response but nothing happened. Maybe he was upstairs too. She rapped again. Meanwhile, she peered through that parlor window. At first glance, she couldn't quite believe what she saw. She hadn't dreamed that such places still existed in this day and age. Usually, even when a house is old, there are some signs of alteration and improvement in the interior. But the parlor she peered at had never been modernized. The floral wallpaper, the dark, heavy, ornately scrolled mahogany woodwork, the turkey red carpet, the high-backed overstuffed furniture and the paneled fireplace were straight out of the gay 90s. There wasn't even a television set to intrude its incongruity in the scene, but she did notice an old wind-up gramophone on an end table. Now she could detect a low murmur of voices, and at first she thought it might be coming from the gramophone's bell-shaped horn. Then she identified the source of the sound. It was coming from upstairs, from the lighted room. Mary knocked again, using the end of the flashlight. This time, she must have made her presence known, for the sound ceased abruptly, and she heard the faint thud of footsteps. A moment later, she saw Mr. Bates descending the stairs. He came to the door and opened it, gesturing her forward. Sorry, he said. I was just tucking Mother in for the night. Sometimes she's apt to be a bit difficult. You said she was ill. I wouldn't want to disturb her. Oh, you won't make any bother. She'll probably sleep like a baby. Mr. Bates glanced over his shoulder at the stairway, then lowered his voice. Actually, she's not sick. Not physically, that is. But sometimes she gets these spells. He nodded abruptly, then smiled. Here, let me just take your coat and hang it up. There. 
Now, if you'll come this way, she followed him down a hallway which extended from under the stairs. I hope you don't mind eating in the kitchen, he murmured. Everything's all ready for us. Sit right down and I'll pour the coffee. The kitchen was a complement of the parlor, lined with ceiling-high glassed-in cupboards grouped about an old-fashioned sink with a hand pump attachment. The big wood stove squatted in one corner, but it gave off a grateful warmth, and the long wooden table bore a welcome display of sausage, cheese, and homemade pickles in glass dishes scattered about on the red and white checkered cloth. Mary was not inclined to smile at the quaintness of it all, and even the inevitable hand crocheted motto on the wall seemed appropriate enough. God bless our home. So be it. This was a lot better than sitting alone in some dingy small-town cafeteria. Mr. Bates helped her fill her plate. Go right ahead. Don't wait for me. You must be hungry. She was hungry, and she ate heartily, with such absorption that she scarcely noticed how little he was eating. When she became aware of it, she was faintly embarrassed. But you haven't touched a thing. I'll bet you really had your own supper earlier. No, I didn't. It's just that I'm not very hungry. He refilled her coffee cup. I'm afraid Mother gets me a little upset sometimes. His voice lowered again, and the apologetic note returned. I guess it's my fault. I'm not too good at taking care of her. You live here all alone, the two of you? Yes, there's never been anybody else. Never. It must be pretty hard on you. I'm not complaining. Don't misunderstand. He adjusted the rimless spectacles. My father went away when I was still a baby. Mother took care of me all alone. There was enough money on her side of the family to keep us going, I guess, until I grew up. Then she mortgaged the house, sold the farm, and built this motel. We ran it together, and it was a good thing, until the new highway cut us off. Actually, of course, she started failing long before then, and it was my turn to take care of her. But sometimes it isn't so easy. There are no other relatives? None. And you've never married? His face reddened, and he glanced down at the checkered tablecloth. Mary bit her lip. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ask personal questions. That's all right. His voice was faint. I've never married. Mother was funny about those things. I... I've never even sat at a table with a girl like this before. But... Sounds odd, doesn't it, in this day and age? I know that. But it has to be. I tell myself that she'd be lost without me now. Maybe the real truth is that I'd be even more lost without her. Mary finished her coffee, fished in her purse for cigarettes, and offered the package to Mr. Bates. No, thank you. I don't smoke. Mind if I do? Not at all. Go right ahead. He hesitated. I'd like to offer you a drink, but, you see, Mother doesn't approve of liquor in the house. Mary leaned back, inhaling. Suddenly, she felt expansive. Funny what a little warmth. A little rest, a little food could do. An hour ago she'd been lonely, wretched, and fearfully unsure of herself. Now everything had changed. Perhaps it was listening to Mr. Bates which had altered her mood this way. He was the lonely, wretched, and fearful one, really. In contrast, she felt seven feet tall. It was this realization which prompted her to speak. You aren't allowed to smoke. You aren't allowed to drink. You aren't allowed to see any girls. Just what do you do besides run the motel and attend to your mother? Apparently he was unconscious of her tone of voice. Oh, I've got lots of things to do, really. I read quite a lot. And there are other hobbies. He glanced up at a wall shelf and she followed his gaze. A stuffed squirrel peered down at them. Hunting? Well, no. Just taxidermy. George Blount gave me that squirrel to stuff. He shot it. Mother doesn't want me to handle firearms. Mr. Bates, you'll pardon me for saying this, but how long do you intend to go on this way? You're a grown man. You certainly must realize that you can't be expected to act like a little boy all the rest of your life. I don't mean to be rude, but I understand. I'm well aware of the situation. As I told you, I've done a bit of reading. I know what the psychologists say about such things, but I have a duty toward my mother. Wouldn't you perhaps be fulfilling that duty to her and to yourself as well if you arranged to put her in an institution? She's not crazy. The voice wasn't soft and apologetic any longer. It was high and shrill, and the pudgy man was on his feet, his hands sweeping a cup from the table. It shattered on the floor. 
but Mary didn't look at it. She could only stare into the shattered face. She's not crazy, he repeated. No matter what you think or anybody thinks, no matter what the books say or what those doctors would say out at the asylum. I know all about that. They'd certify her in a hurry and lock her away if they could. All I'd have to do is give them the word. But I wouldn't because I know. Don't you understand that? I know and they don't know. They don't know how she took care of me all those years when there was nobody else who cared, how she worked for me and suffered because of me, the sacrifices she made. If she's a little odd now, it's my fault. I'm responsible. When she came to me that time, told me she wanted to get married again, I'm the one who stopped her. Yes, I stopped her. I was to blame for that. You don't have to tell me about jealousy, possessiveness. I was worse than she could ever be. Ten times crazier, if that's the word you want to use. They'd have locked me up in a minute if they knew the things I said and did, the way I carried on. Well, I got over it, finally. And she didn't. But who are you to say a person should be put away? I think perhaps all of us go a little crazy at times. He stopped, not because he was out of words, but because he was out of breath. His face was very red and the puckered lips were beginning to tremble. Mary stood up. I'm... I'm sorry, she said softly. Really, I am. I want to apologize. I had no right to say what I did. Yes, I know, but it doesn't matter. It's just that I'm not used to talking about these things. You live alone like this and everything gets bottled up. Bottled up or stuffed like that squirrel up there. His color lightened and he attempted a smile. Cute little fellow, isn't he? I've often wished I had a live one around that I could tame for a pet. Mary picked up her purse. I'll be running along now. It's getting late. Please don't go. I'm sorry I made such a fuss. It isn't that. I'm really very tired. But I thought perhaps we could talk a while. I was going to tell you about my hobbies. I've got a sort of workshop down in the basement. No, I'd like to, but I simply must get some rest. All right, then. I'll walk down with you. I've got to close up the office. It doesn't look as if there'll be any more business tonight. They went through the hall and he helped her on with her coat. He was clumsy about it, and for a moment she felt rising irritation, then checked it as she realized the cause. He was afraid to touch her. That was it. The poor guy was actually afraid to get near a woman. He held the flashlight and she followed him out of the house and down the pathway to the gravel drive curving around the motel. The rain had stopped, but the night was still dark and starless. As she turned the corner of the building, she glanced back over her shoulder at the house. The upstairs light still burned, and Mary wondered if the old woman was awake, if she had listened to their conversation, heard the final outburst. Mr. Bates halted before her door, waited until she inserted the key in the lock and opened it. Good night, Amida, he said. Sleep well. Thank you and thanks for the hospitality. He opened his mouth, then turned away. For the third time that evening, she saw him redden. Then she closed her door and locked it. She could hear his retreating footsteps, then the telltale click as he entered the office next door. She didn't hear him when he left. Her attention had been immediately occupied by the duty of unpacking. She got out her pajamas, her slippers, a jar of cold cream, a toothbrush and toothpaste. Then she rummaged through the big suitcase looking for the dress she planned to wear tomorrow when she saw Sam. That would have to be put up now to hang out the wrinkles. Nothing must be out of place tomorrow. Nothing must be out of place. All at once she didn't feel seven feet tail anymore. Or was the change really so sudden? Hadn't it started when Mr. Bates got so hysterical back there at the house? What was it he had said which really deflated her? I think perhaps all of us go a little crazy at times. Mary Crane cleared a place for herself on the bed and sat down. Yes, it was true. All of us go a little crazy at times, just as she'd gone crazy yesterday afternoon when she saw that money on the desk. And she'd been crazy ever since. She must have been crazy to think she could get away with what she planned. It had all seemed like a dream come true, and that's what it was. A dream. A crazy dream. She knew it now. Maybe she could manage to throw off the police. But Sam would ask questions. Who was this relative she'd inherited the money from? Where had he lived? 
Why hadn't she ever mentioned him before? How was it that she brought the money along in cash? Didn't Mr. Lowry object to her quitting her job so suddenly? And then there was Lila. Suppose she reacted as Mary had anticipated, came to her without going to the police, even consented to remain silent in the future because of a sense of obligation. The fact remained that she'd know, and there'd be complications. Sooner or later, Sam would want to visit her down there, or invite her up, and that would never work. She could never keep up a future relationship with her sister, never explain to Sam why it was impossible to do so, why she wouldn't go back to Texas even for a visit. No, the whole thing was crazy, and it was too late to do anything about it now. Or was it? Suppose she got herself some sleep, a good long ten hours of sleep. Tomorrow was Sunday. If she left here about nine and drove straight through, she could be back in town Monday morning, early. Before Lila arrived from Dallas, before the bank opened, she could deposit the money and go on to work from there. Sure, she'd be dead tired, but it wouldn't kill her, and nobody would ever know. There was the matter of the car, of course. That would take some explaining, for Lila's benefit. Maybe she could tell her that she'd started out for Fairvale, intending to surprise Sam over the weekend. The car broke down and she had to have it towed away. The dealer said it would need a new engine, so she decided to junk it, take this old heap instead, and come back home. Yes, that would sound reasonable. Of course, when she figured everything up, this trip would actually cost about $700. That's what the car had been worth. But the price was worth paying. $700 isn't too much to pay for one's sanity, for one's safety, one's future security. Mary stood up. She'd do it. And all at once, she was seven feet tall again. It was that simple. If she'd been a religious girl, she would have prayed. As it was, she felt a curious sense of, what was that word? Predestination. As if everything that had happened was somehow fated to be. Her turning off on the wrong road, coming here, meeting that pathetic man, listening to his outburst, hearing that final sentence which brought her to her senses. For a moment, she could have gone to him and kissed him until she realized with a giggle what his response would be to such a gesture. The poor old geezer would probably faint. She giggled again. It was nice to be seven feet tall, but the question was, would she be able to fit inside the shower stall? And that's what she was going to do right now, take a nice, long, hot shower. Get the dirt off her hide, just as she was going to get the dirt cleaned out of her insides. Come clean, Mary. Come clean as snow. She stepped into the bathroom, kicking off her shoes, stooping to slip her stockings off. Then she raised her arms, pulled the dress over her head, tossed it into the next room. It missed the bed, but she didn't care. She unhooked her bra, swung it in an arc, and let it sail. Now the panties. For a moment, she stood before the mirror set in the door and took stock of herself. Maybe the face was 27, but the body was free, white, and 21. She had a good figure. A damned good figure. Sam would like it. She wished he was here to admire it now. It was going to be hell to wait another two years. But then she'd make up for lost time. They say a woman isn't fully mature, sexually, until she's 30. That was something to find out about. Mary giggled again, then executed an amateurish bump and grind, tossed her image a kiss, and received one in return. After that, she stepped into the shower stall. The water was hot, and she had to add a mixture from the cold faucet. Finally, she turned both faucets on full force and let the warmth gush over her. The roar was deafening, and the room was beginning to steam up. That's why she didn't hear the door open or note the sound of footsteps. And at first, when the shower curtains parted, the steam obscured the face. Then she did see it there, just a face peering through the... Curtains hanging in midair like a mask. A headscarf concealed the hair and the glassy eyes stared inhumanly. But it wasn't a mask, it couldn't be. The skin had been powdered dead white and two hectic spots of rouge centered on the cheekbones. It wasn't a mask. It was the face of a crazy old woman. Mary started to scream and then the curtains parted further and a hand appeared, holding a butcheress knife. 
It was the knife that, a moment later, cut off her scream and her head. Chapter 4 The minute Norman got inside the office, he started to tremble. It was the reaction, of course. Too much had happened, and too quickly. He couldn't bottle it up any longer. Bottle? That's what he needed. A drink. He'd lied to the girl, of course. It was true mother wouldn't allow liquor in the house, but he did drink. He kept a bottle down here at the office. There were times when you had to drink, even if you knew you had no stomach for liquor, even if a few ounces were enough to make you dizzy, make you pass out. There were times when you wanted to pass out. Norman remembered to pull down the Venetian blinds and switch off the sign outside. There, that did it. Closed for the night. Nobody would notice the dim light of the desk lamp now that the blinds were down. Nobody could look in and see him opening the desk drawer and pulling out the bottle his hands trembling like a baby's. Baby needs his bottle. He tilted the pint back and drank, closing his eyes as he did so. The whiskey burned, and that was good. Let it burn away the bitterness. The warmth crept down his throat, exploded in his stomach. Maybe another drink would burn away the taste of fear. It had been a mistake to invite the girl up to the house. Norman knew that the moment he opened his mouth. But she was so pretty and she had looked so tired and forlorn. He knew what it was to be tired and forlorn, with nobody to turn to, nobody who'd understand. All he meant to do, all he did do, was talk to her. Besides, it was his house, wasn't it? Just as much as it was Mother's. She had no right to lay down the law that way. Still, it had been a mistake. Actually, he never would have dared, except that he'd been so angry with Mother. He'd wanted to defy her. That was bad, but he had done something far worse after he extended the invitation. He'd gone back to the house and told Mother he was having company. He'd marched right up to the bedroom and announced it, just as much as to say, I dare you to do something about it. It was the wrong thing to do. She was worked up enough already, and when he told her about the girl coming for supper, she practically had hysterics. She was hysterical, the way she carried on, the things she said. If you bring her here, I'll kill her. I'll kill the bitch. Bitch. Mother didn't talk that way. But that's what she had said. She was sick. Very sick. Maybe the girl had been right. Maybe Mother should be put away. It was getting so he couldn't handle her alone anymore. Getting so he couldn't handle himself either. What had Mother used to say about handling himself? It was a sin. You could burn in hell. The whiskey burned. His third drink but he needed it. He needed a lot of things. The girl was right about that, too. This was no way to live. He couldn't go on much longer. Just getting through the meal had been an ordeal. He'd been afraid Mother would make a scene. After he locked the door to her room and left her up there, he kept wondering if she'd start screaming and pounding. But she had kept very quiet, almost too quiet, as though she was listening. Probably that's just what she had been doing. You could lock Mother up, but you couldn't keep her from listening. Norman hoped she'd gone to sleep by now. Tomorrow she might forget the whole episode. That often happened. And then again, sometimes when he thought she had completely forgotten an incident, she'd bring it up out of a clear blue sky months afterward. Clear blue sky. He chuckled at the phrase, There weren't any clear blue skies anymore. Just clouds and darkness, like tonight. Then he heard a sound and he shifted quickly in his chair. Was Mother coming? No, it couldn't be. He'd locked her up, remember? It must be that girl in the next room. Yes, he could hear her now. She'd opened her suitcase, apparently, and she was taking things out, getting ready for bed. Norman took another drink, just to steady his nerves. And this time it worked. His hand wasn't trembling anymore. He wasn't afraid. Not if he thought about the girl. Funny, when he actually saw her, he had this terrible feeling of, what was the word, im-something, importance. No, that wasn't it. He didn't feel important when he was with a woman. He felt impossible. That wasn't right either. He knew the word he was looking for. He'd read it a hundred times in books, the kind of books mother didn't even know he owned. Well, it didn't matter. When he was with the girl, he felt that way, but not now. Now he could do anything and there were so many things he wanted to do with a girl like that. Young, pretty, 
intelligent too. He'd made a fool of himself answering her back when she talked about mother. Now he admitted she had told the truth. She knew she could understand. He wished she would have stayed and talked more. As it was, maybe he'd never see her again. Tomorrow she'd be gone. Gone forever. Jane Wilson of San Antonio, Texas. He wondered who she was, where she was going, what kind of a person she really was inside. He could fall in love with a girl like that. Yes, he could, after just seeing her a single time. It was nothing to laugh at. But she'd laugh, probably. That's the way girls were. They always laughed, because they were bitches. Mother was right. They were bitches. But you couldn't help yourself, not when a bitch was as lovely as this one was, and you knew you would never see her again. You had to see her again. If you were any kind of a man, you'd have told her so when you were in her room. You'd have brought in the bottle and offered her a drink, drunk with her, and then you'd carry her over to the bed and... No, you wouldn't. Not you, because you're impotent. That's the word you couldn't remember, isn't it? Impotent. The word the books used, the word mother used, the word that meant you were never going to see her again because it wouldn't do any good. The word the bitches knew, they must know it, and that's why they always laughed. Norman took another drink, just a sip. He could feel the wetness trickle down the side of his chin. He must be drunk. All right, he was drunk. What did it matter? As long as mother didn't know. As long as the girl didn't know. It would all be a big secret. Impotent, was he? Well, that didn't mean he couldn't see her again. He was going to see her right now. Norman bent forward across the desk, his head inclined and almost touching the wall. He'd heard more sounds and from long experience he knew how to interpret them. The girl had kicked off her shoes. Now she was coming into the bathroom. He reached out his hand. It was trembling again, but not with fear. This was anticipation. He knew what he was going to do. He was going to tilt the framed license on the wall to one side and peek through the little hole he drilled so long ago. Nobody else knew about the little hole. Not even Mother. Most certainly not Mother. It was his secret. The little hole was just a crack in the plaster on the other side, but he could see through it, see through it into the lighted bathroom. Sometimes he'd catch a person standing right in front of it. Sometimes he'd catch their reflection on the door mirror beyond. But he could see, he could see plenty. Let the bitches laugh at him. He knew more about them than they ever dreamed. It was hard for Norman to focus his eyes. He felt hot and dizzy, hot and dizzy. Part of it was due to the drinks, part to the excitement, but most of it was due to her. She was in the bathroom now, standing there facing the wall, but she wouldn't notice the crack. They never did. She was smiling, fluffing out her hair. Now she stooped, sliding down her stockings, and as she straightened up, yes, she was going to do it. The dress was coming off over her head. He could see the bra and panties. She mustn't stop now. She mustn't turn away. But she did turn away, and Norman almost called out to her, Come back here, you bitch! But he remembered just in time, and then he saw that she was unhooking her bra in front of the door mirror, and he could see, except that the mirror was all wavy lines and lights that made him dizzy, and it was hard to make out anything until she stepped a little to one side. Then he could see her. Now she was going to take them off. She was taking them off, and he could see she was standing before the mirror and actually gesturing. Did she know? Had she known all along? Known about the hole in the wall? Known that he was watching? Did she want him to watch? Was she doing this to him on purpose, the bitch? She was swaying back and forth, back and forth, and now the mirror was wavy again, and she was wavy, and he couldn't stand it. He wanted to pound on the wall. He wanted to scream at her to stop because this was an evil, perverted thing she was doing, and she must stop before he became evil and perverted too. That's what the bitches did to you. They perverted you, and she was a bitch. They were all bitches. Mother was a... Suddenly she was gone, and there was only the roaring. It welled up, shaking the wall, drowning out the words and the thoughts. It was coming from inside his head, and he fell back in the chair. I'm drunk, he told himself. I'm passing out. But that was not entirely so. 
The roaring continued, and somewhere inside it he heard another sound. The office door was opening. How could that be? He'd locked it, hadn't he? And he still had the key. If only he'd open his eyes, he could find it. But he couldn't open his eyes. He didn't dare, because now he knew. Mother had a key, too. She had a key to her room. She had a key to the house. She had a key to the office. And she was standing there now, looking down at him. He hoped she would think he had just fallen asleep. What was she doing here, anyway? Had she heard him leave with the girl, come down to spy on him? Norman slumped back, not daring to move, not wanting to move. Every instant it was getting harder and harder to move, even if he had wanted to. The roaring was steady now, and the vibration was rocking him to sleep. That was nice, to be rocked to sleep with mother standing over you. Then she was gone. She turned around without saying anything and gone out. There was nothing to be afraid of. She'd come to protect him from the bitches. Yes, that was it. She'd come to protect him. Whenever he needed her, mother was there. And now he could sleep. There was no trick to it at all. You merely went into the roaring and then passed the roaring. Then everything was silent. Sleep. Silent. Sleep. Norman came to with a start, jerking his head back. God, it ached. He'd passed out there in the chair, actually passed out. No wonder everything was pounding, roaring, roaring. He'd heard the same sound before. How long ago? An hour? Two hours? Now he recognized it. The shower was going next door. That was it. The girl had gone into the shower. But that had been so long ago. She couldn't still be in there, could she? He reached forward, tilting the framed license on the wall. His eyes squinted and then focused on the brightly lit bathroom beyond. It was empty. He couldn't see into the shower stall on the side. The curtains were closed and he couldn't see. Maybe she'd forgotten about the shower and gone to bed leaving it turned on. It seemed odd that she'd be able to sleep with the water running full force that way, but then he'd done it himself just now. Maybe fatigue was as intoxicating as alcohol. Anyway, there didn't seem to be anything wrong. The bathroom was in order. Norman scanned it once again, then noticed the floor. Water from the shower was trickling across the tiles. Not much, just a little. Just enough for him to see it. A tiny rivulet of water trailing across the white tiled floor. Or was it water? Water isn't pink. Water doesn't have tiny threads of red in it. Tiny threads of red like veins. She must have slipped. She must have fallen and hurt herself, Norman decided. The panic was rising in him, but he knew what he must do. He grabbed up his keys from the desk and hurried out of the office. Quickly, he found the right one for the adjoining unit and opened the door. The bedroom was empty, but the open suitcase still rested on the bed itself. She hadn't gone away. So he'd guessed correctly. There'd been an accident in the shower. He'd have to go in there. It wasn't until he actually entered the bathroom that he remembered something else. And then it was too late. The panic burst loose, but that didn't help him now. He still remembered. Mother had keys to the motel, too. And then, as he ripped back the shower curtains and stared down at the hacked and twisted thing sprawled on the floor of the stall, he realized that Mother had used her keys. Chapter 5 Norman locked the door behind him and went up to the house. His clothes were a mess. Blood on them, of course, and water, and then he'd been sick all over the bathroom floor. But that wasn't important now. There were other things which must be cleaned up first. This time, B was going to do something about it, once and for all. He was going to put Mother where she belonged. He had to. All the panic, all the fear, all the horror and nausea and revulsion gave way to this overriding resolve. What had happened was tragic, dreadful beyond words. But it would never happen again. He felt like a new man, his own man. Norman hurried up the steps and tried the front door. It was unlocked. The light in the parlor was still burning, but it was empty. He gave a quick glance around, then mounted the stairs. The door to Mother's room stood open, and lamplight fanned forth into the hall. He stepped in, not bothering to knock. No need to pretend anymore. She couldn't get away with this. She couldn't get away, but she had. 
The bedroom was empty. He could see the rumpled indentation where she had lain, see the covers flung back on the big four-poster, smell the faint, musty scent still in the room. The rocker rested in the corner. The ornaments stood on the dresser just as they were always arranged. Nothing had changed in Mother's room. Nothing ever changed. But Mother was gone. He stepped over to the closet, ruffling the clothing on the hangers lining the long center pole. Here the acrid scent was very strong. So strong he almost choked. But there was another odor too. It wasn't until his foot slipped that he looked down and realized where it was coming from. One of her dresses and a headscarf were balled up on the floor. He stooped to retrieve them, then shivered in revulsion as he noted the dark, reddish stains of clotted blood. She'd come back here then, come back, changed her clothes, and gone off once more. He couldn't call the police. That was the thing he had to remember. He mustn't call the police. Not even now, knowing what she had done, because she wasn't really responsible. She was sick. Cold-blooded murder is one thing, but sickness is another. You aren't really a murderer when you're sick in the head. Anybody knows that. Only sometimes the courts didn't agree. He'd read of cases. Even if they did recognize what was wrong with her, they'd still put her away. Not in a rest home, but in one of those awful holes. A state hospital. Norman stared at the neat, old-fashioned room with its wallpaper pattern of rambler roses. He couldn't take Mother away from this and see her locked up in a bare cell. Right now, he was safe. The police didn't even know about Mother. She stayed here in the house, and nobody knew. It had been all right to tell the girl, because she'd never see him again. But the police couldn't find out about Mother and what she was like. They'd put her away to rot. No matter what she'd done, she didn't deserve that. And she wouldn't have to get it, because nobody knew what she'd done. He was pretty certain now that he could keep anyone from knowing. All he had to do was think it over. Think back to the events of the evening. Think carefully. The girl had driven in alone, said she'd been on the road all day. That meant she wasn't visiting en route, and she didn't seem to know where Fairvale was, didn't mention any other towns nearby. So the chances were she had no intention of seeing anyone around here. Whoever expected her, if anyone was expecting her, must live some distance further north. Of course, this was all supposition, but it seemed logical enough, and he'd have to take a chance on being right. She had signed the register, of course, but that meant nothing. If anybody ever asked, he'd say that she had spent the night and driven on. All he had to do was get rid of the body in the car and make sure that everything was cleaned up afterward. That part would be easy. He knew just how to do it. It wouldn't be pleasant, but it wouldn't be difficult either, and it would save him from going to the police. It would save Mother. Oh, he still intended to have things out with her. He wasn't backing down on that part of it, not this time. But this could wait until afterward. The big thing now was to dispose of the evidence. The corpus delicti. Mother's dress and scarf would have to be burned, and so would the clothing he was wearing. No, on second thought, he might as well get rid of it all when he got rid of the body. Norman wadded the garments into a ball and carried them downstairs. He grabbed an old shirt and pair of coveralls from the hook in the back hallway, then shed his clothing in the kitchen and donned the others. No sense stopping to wash up now. That could wait until the rest of the messy business was completed. But Mother had remembered to wash when she came back. He could see more of the pink stains here at the kitchen sink, a few telltale traces of rouge and powder too. He made a mental note to clean everything thoroughly when he got back, then sat down and transferred everything from the pockets of his discarded clothing to those in his coveralls. It was a pity to throw away good clothes like this, but that couldn't be helped. Not if Mother was to be helped. Norman went down into the basement and opened the door of the old fruit cellar. He found what he was looking for, a discarded clothes hamper with a sprung cover. It was large enough and it would do nicely. Nicely. God, how can you think like that about what you're proposing to do? He winced at the realization, then took a deep breath. This was no time to be self-conscious or self-critical. One had to be practical. Very practical. Very careful. Very calm. Calmly, he tossed his clothes into the hamper. Calmly, 
he took an old oilcloth from the table near the cellar stairs. Calmly, he went back upstairs, snapped off the kitchen light, snapped off the hall light, and let himself out of the house in darkness, carrying the hamper with the oilcloth on top. It was harder to be calm here in the dark, harder not to think about a hundred and one things that might go wrong. Mother had wandered off. Where? Was she out on the highway, ready to be picked up by anyone who might come driving by? Was she still suffering a hysterical reaction? Would the shock of what she had done cause her to blurt out the truth to whoever came along and found her? Had she actually run away, or was she merely in a daze? Maybe she'd gone down past the woods back of the house, along the narrow ten-acre strip of their land which stretched off into the swamp. Wouldn't it be better to search for her first? Norman sighed and shook his head. He couldn't afford the risk. Not while that thing still sprawled in the shower stall back at the motel. Leaving it there was even more risky. He'd had the presence of mind to turn off all the lights, both in the office and in her room before leaving. But even so, one never knew when some night owl might show up and nose around looking for accommodations. It didn't happen very often, but every once in a while the signal would buzz, sometimes at one or two o'clock in the morning, and at least once in the course of a night the state highway patrol car cruised past her. It almost never stopped, but there was the chance. He stumbled along in the pitch blackness of moonless midnight. The path was graveled and not muddy, but the rain would have softened the ground behind the house. There'd be tracks. That was something else to think about. He'd leave tracks he couldn't even see. If only it wasn't so dark. All at once, that was the most important thing. To get out of the dark. Norman was very grateful when he finally opened the door of the girl's room and eased the hamper inside then set it down and switched on the light. The soft glow reassured him for a moment until he remembered what the light would reveal when he went into the bathroom. He stood in the center of the bedroom now, and he began to tremble. No, I can't do it. I can't look at her. I won't go in there. I won't. But you have to. There's no other way. And stop talking to yourself. That was the most important thing. He had to stop talking to himself. He had to get back that calm feeling again. He had to face reality. And what was reality? A dead girl. The girl his mother had killed. Not a pretty sight, nor a pretty notion. But there it was. Walking away wouldn't bring the girl back to life again. Turning mother in to the police wouldn't help alter the situation either. The best thing to do under the circumstances, the only thing to do, was to get rid of her. He needn't feel guilty about it, but he couldn't hold back his nausea, his dizziness, and his dry, convulsive retching when it came to actually going into the shower stall and doing what must be done there. He found the butcher knife almost at once. It was under the torso. He dropped that into the hamper immediately. There was an old pair of gloves in his coverall pockets. He had to put them on before he could bring himself to touch the rest. The head was the worst. Nothing else was severed only slashed, and he had to fold the limbs before he could wrap the body in the oilcloth and crowd it down into the hamper on the top of the clothing. Then it was done, and he slammed the lid shut. That still left the bathroom and the shower stall itself to be cleaned up, but he'd deal with that part of the job when he came back. Now he had to lug the hamper out into the bedroom, then put it down while he found the girl's purse and ransacked it for her car keys. He opened the door slowly, scanning the road for passing headlights. Nothing was coming. Nothing had come this way for hours. He could only hope and pray that nothing would come now. He was sweating long before he managed to open the trunk of the car and place the hamper inside. Sweating, not with exertion, but with fear. But he made it, and then he was back in the room again, picking up the clothing and shoving it into the overnight bag and the big suitcase on the bed. He found the shoes, the stockings, the bra, the panties. Touching the bra and panties was the worst. If there had been anything left in his stomach, it would have come up then. But there was nothing in his stomach but the dryness of fear, just as the wetness of fear soaked his outer skin. Now what? Kleenex, hairpins, all the little things a woman leaves scattered around the room. Yes, in her purse. It had some money in it, 
but he didn't even bother to look. He didn't want the money. He just wanted to get rid of it fast while luck still held. He put the two bags in the car on the front seat. Then he closed and locked the door of the room. Again, he scanned the roadway in both directions. All clear. Norman started the motor and switched on the lights. That was the dangerous part, using the lights. But he'd never be able to make it otherwise. Not through the field. He drove slowly, up the slope behind the motel and along the gravel leading to the driveway and the house. Another stretch of gravel went to the rear of the house and terminated at the old shed, which had been converted to serve as a garage for Norman Chevy. He shifted gears and eased off onto the grass. He was in the field now, bumping along. There was a rutted path here, worn by tire tracks, and he found it. Every few months, Norman took his own car along this route, hitching up the trailer and going into the woods bordering the swamp to collect firewood for the kitchen. That's what he'd do tomorrow, he decided. First thing in the morning, he'd take the car and trailer out there. Then his own tire marks would cover up these. And if he left footprints in the mud, there'd be an explanation. If he needed an explanation, that is. But maybe his luck would hold. It held long enough for him to reach the edge of the swamp and do what he had to do. Once back there, he switched off the headlights and taillights and worked in the dark. It wasn't easy and it took a long time, but he managed. Starting the motor and shifting into reverse, he jumped out and let it back down the slope into the muddy quagmire. The slope would show tire tracks too, and he must remember to smooth away the traces. But that wasn't the important thing now, just as long as the car sank. He could see the muck bubbling and rising up over the wheels. God, it had to keep sinking now. If it didn't, he could never pull it out again. It had to sink. The fenders were going under, slowly, very slowly. How long had he been standing here? It seemed like hours, and still the car was visible. But the ooze had reached the door handles. It was coming up over the side glass and the windshield. There wasn't a sound to be heard. The car kept descending inch by silent inch. Now only the top was visible. Suddenly there was a sort of sucking noise, a nasty and abrupt plop, and the car was gone. It had settled beneath the surface of the swamp. Norman didn't know how deep the swamp was at this point. He could only hope the car would keep on going down. Down, deep down, where nobody could ever find it. He turned away with a grimace. Well, that part of it was finished. The car was in the swamp, and the hamper was in the trunk, and the body was in the hamper, the twisted torso and the bloody head. But he couldn't think about that. He mustn't. There were other things to do. He did them, did them almost mechanically. There was soap and detergent in the office, a brush and a pail. He went over the bathroom inch by inch, then the shower stall. As long as he concentrated on scrubbing, it wasn't so bad even though the smell sickened him. Then he inspected the bedroom once more. Luck was still with him. Just under the bed, he found an earring. He hadn't noticed that she was wearing earrings earlier in the evening, but she must have been. Maybe it had slipped off when she shook out her hair. If not, the other one would be around here somewhere. Norman was bleary-eyed and weary, but he searched. It wasn't anywhere in the room, so it must either be in her baggage or still attached to her ear. In either case, it wouldn't matter, just as long as he got rid of this one. Throw it in the swamp tomorrow. Now there was only the house to attend to. He'd scrub out of the kitchen sink. It was almost two o'clock by the grandfather clock in the hall when he came in. He could scarcely keep his eyes open long enough to wash the stains from the sink top. Then he stepped out of his muddy shoes, peeled off the coveralls, stripped himself of shirt and socks, and washed. The water was cold as ice, but it didn't revive him. His body was numb. Tomorrow morning, he'd go back down into the swamp with his own car. He'd wear the same clothing again, and it wouldn't matter if it showed mud and dirt. Just as long as there was no blood anywhere. No blood on his clothes. No blood on his body. No blood on his hands. There. Now he was clean. He could move his numb legs, propel his numb body up the stairs and into the bedroom, sink into bed and sleep with clean hands. It wasn't until he was actually in the bedroom, donning his pajamas, that he remembered what was still wrong. Mother hadn't come back. 
She was still wandering around, God knows where, in the middle of the night. He had to get dressed again and go out. He had to find her. Or did he? The thought came creeping, just as the numbness came creeping, stealing over his senses, softly, smoothly, there in the silken silence. Why should he concern himself about mother after what she had done? Maybe she had been picked up or would be. Maybe she'd even babble out the story of what she'd done. But who'd believe it? There was no evidence, not anymore. All he'd need to do was deny everything. Maybe he wouldn't even have to do that much. Anyone who saw Mother, listened to her wild story, would know she was crazy. And then they'd lock her up, lock her up in a place where she didn't have a key and couldn't get out again. And that would be the end. He hadn't felt like that earlier this evening, he remembered. But that was before he had to go into that bathroom again, before he had to go into the shower stall and see those things. Mother had done that to him. Mother had done that to the poor, helpless girl. She had taken a butcher knife and she had hacked and ripped. Nobody but a maniac could have committed such an atrocity. He had to face facts. She was a maniac. She deserved to be put away, had to be put away for her own safety as well as the safety of others. If they did pick her up, he'd see that it happened. But the chances were actually that she wouldn't go anywhere near the highway. Most likely, she had stayed right around the house or the yard. Maybe she had even followed him down into the swamp. She could have been watching him all the time. Of course, if she were really out of her head, then anything might happen. If she had gone to the swamp, perhaps she'd slipped. It was quite possible, there in the dark. He remembered the way the car had gone down, disappearing in the quicksand. Norman knew he wasn't thinking clearly anymore. He was faintly aware of the fact that he was lying on the bed, had been lying on the bed for a long time now, and he wasn't really deciding what to do either, or wondering about mother and where she was. Instead, he was watching her. He could see her now, even though at the same time, he felt the numb pressure on his eyeballs and knew that his eyelids were closed. He could see mother, and she was in the swamp. That's where she was in the swamp. She'd blundered down the bank in the darkness, and she couldn't get out again. The muck was bubbling up around her knees. She was trying to grab a branch or something solid and pull herself out again. But it was no use. Her hips were sinking under. Her dress was pressed tight in a V across the front of her things. Mother's thighs were dirty. Mustn't look. But he wanted to look. He wanted to see her go down. Down into the soft, wet, slimy darkness. She deserved it. She deserved to go down, to join that poor, innocent girl. Good riddance. In a little while now, he'd be free of them both. Victim and victor, mother and the bitch. Bitch mother down there in the dirty slime. Let it happen. Let her drown in the filthy, nasty scum. Now it was up over her breasts. He didn't like to think about such things. He never thought about mother's breasts. He mustn't. And it was good that they were disappearing sinking away forever so he'd never think about such things again. But he could see her gasping for breath and it made him gasp too. He felt as if he were choking with her. And then, it was a dream. It had to be a dream. Mother was suddenly standing on the firm ground at the edge of the swamp and he was sinking. He was in filth up to his neck and there was nobody to save him, nobody to help him, nothing to hang on to unless Mother held out her arms. She could save him. She was the only one. He didn't want to drown. He didn't want to strangle and suffocate in the slime. He didn't want to go down there the way the girl bitch had gone down. And now he remembered why she was there. It was because she had been killed. And she had been killed because she was evil. She had flaunted herself before him. She had deliberately tempted him with the perversion of her nakedness. Why, he'd wanted to kill her himself when she did that. Because mother had taught him about evil and the ways of evil, and thou shalt not suffer a bitch to live. So what mother had done was to protect him, and he couldn't see her die. She wasn't wrong. He needed her now, and she needed him. And even if she were crazy, she wouldn't let him go under now. She couldn't. The foulness was sucking against his throat. It was kissing his lips, and if he opened his mouth, 
He knew he'd swallow it, but he had to open it to scream, and he was screaming. Mother! Mother! Save me! And then he was out of the swamp, back here in bed where he belonged, and his body was wet only with perspiration. He knew now that it had been a dream, even before he heard her voice there at the bedside. It's all right, son. I'm here. Everything's all right. He could feel her hand on his forehead, and it was cool, like the drying sweat. He wanted to open his eyes, but she said, Don't you worry, son. Just go back to sleep. But I have to tell you, I know, I was watching. You didn't think I'd go away and leave you, did you? You did right, Norman, and everything's all right now. Yes, that was the way it should be. She was there to protect him. He was there to protect her. Just before he drifted off to sleep again, Norman made up his mind. They wouldn't talk about what had happened tonight, not now or ever, and he wouldn't think about sending her away. No matter what she did, she belonged here, with him. Maybe she was crazy and a murderess, but she was all he had, all he wanted, all he needed. Just knowing she was here beside him as he went to sleep. Norman stirred, turned, and then fell into a darkness deeper and more engulfing than the swamp. Chapter 6 Promptly at 6 o'clock on the following Friday evening, a miracle happened. Ottorino Respighi came into the back room of Fairvale's only hardware store to play his Brazilian impressions. Ottorino Respighi had been dead for many years in the symphonic group Il Orchestre de Concert Colonef had been conducted in the work many thousands of miles away. But when Sam Loomis reached out and switched on the tiny FM radio, the music welled forth, annihilating space and time and death itself. It was, as far as he understood it, an authentic miracle. For a moment, Sam wished that he weren't alone. Miracles are meant to be shared. Music is meant to be shared. But there was no one in Fairvale who would recognize either the music itself or the miracle of its coming. Fairvale people were inclined to be practical about things. Music was just something you got when you put a nickel in a jukebox or turned on the television set. Mostly it was rock and roll, but once in a while there'd be some long hair stuff like that William Tell piece they played for westerns. What's so wonderful about this Otterino, what's his name, or whoever he is? Sam Loomis shrugged then grinned. He wasn't complaining about the situation. Maybe small town people didn't dig his sort of music but at least they left him the freedom to enjoy it for himself, just as he made no attempt to influence their tastes. It was a fair bargain. Sam pulled out the big ledger and carried it over to the kitchen table. For the next hour, the table would double in brass as his desk, just as he would double in brass as his own bookkeeper. That was one of the drawbacks of living here in one room behind the hardware store. There was no extra space available, and everything doubled in brass. Still, he accepted the situation. It wouldn't go on this way very much longer, the way things were breaking for him these days. A quick glance at the figures seemed to confirm his optimism. He'd have to do some checking on inventory requirements, but it looked very much as if he might be able to pay off another thousand this month. That would bring the total up to three thousand for the half-year mark. And this was off-season, too. There'd be more business coming in this fall. Sam scribbled a hasty figure check on a sheet of scratch paper. Yes, he could probably swing it. Made him feel pretty good. It ought to make Mary feel pretty good, too. Mary hadn't been too cheerful lately. At least her letters sounded as if she were depressed. When she wrote it all, that is. Come to think of it, she owed him several letters now. He'd written her again last Friday, and still no reply. Maybe she was sick. No, if that was the case, he'd have gotten a note from the kid sister, Lila, or whatever her name was. Chances were that Mary was just discouraged, down in the dumps. Well, he didn't blame her. She'd been sweating things out for a long time. So had he, of course. It wasn't easy, living like this. But it was the only way. She understood. She agreed to wait. Maybe he ought to take a few days off next week, leave Summerfield in charge here, and take a run down to see her. Just drop in and surprise her, cheer her up. Why not? Things were very slack at the moment and Bob could handle the store alone. Sam sighed. The music was descending now, spiraling to a minor key. This must be the theme for the snake garden. Yes, he recognized it, 
with its slithering strings, its writhing woodwinds squirming over the sluggish bass. Snakes. Mary didn't like snakes. Chances were she didn't like this kind of music either. Sometimes he almost wondered if they hadn't made a mistake when they planned ahead. After all, what did they really know about each other? Aside from the companionship of the cruise and the two days Mary had spent here last year, they'd never been together. There were the letters, of course, but maybe they just made things worse. Because in the letters, Sam had begun to find another Mary, a moody, almost petulant personality given to likes and dislikes so emphatic they were almost prejudices. He shrugged. What had come over him? Was it the morbidity of the music? All at once he felt tension in the muscles at the back of his neck. He listened intently, trying to isolate the instrument, pinpoint the phrase that had triggered his reaction. Something was wrong. Something he sensed. Something he could almost hear. Sam rose, pushing back his chair. He could hear it now. A faint rattling from up front. Of course, that's all it was. He had heard something to bother him. Somebody was turning the knob of the front door. The store was closed for the night, the shades drawn, but maybe it was some tourist. Most likely would be. Folks in town knew when he closed up, and they also knew he lived in the back room. If they wanted to come down for anything after regular hours, they'd phone first. Well, business was business, whoever the customer might be. Same turned and went into the store, hurrying down the dim aisle. The blind had been pulled down on the front door, but he could hear the agitated rattling very plainly now. In fact, some of the pots and pans on the traffic item counter were jiggling. This must be an emergency, all right. Probably the customer needed a new bulb for his kid's Mickey Mouse flashlight. Sam fumbled in his pocket, pulling out his key ring. All right, he called. I'm opening up. And did so deftly, swinging the door back without withdrawing the key. She stood there in the doorway, silhouetted against the street lamp's glow from the curbing outside. For a moment, the shock of recognition held him immobile. Then he stepped forward and his arms closed around her. Mary, he murmured. His mouth found hers gratefully, greedily, and then she was stiffening. She was pulling away. Her hands had come up, shaping into bald fists that beat against his chest. What was wrong? I'm not Mary, she gasped. I'm Lila. Lila? He stepped back once more. The kid. I mean, Mary's sister? She nodded. As she did so, he caught a glimpse of her face in profile, and the lamplight glinted on her hair. It was brown, much lighter than Mary's. Now he could see the difference in the shape of the snub nose, the higher angle of the broad cheekbones. She was a trifle shorter, too, and her hips and shoulders seemed slimmer. I'm sorry, he murmured. It's this light. That's all right. Her voice was different, too, softer and lower. Come inside, won't you? Well, she hesitated, glancing down at her feet, and then Sam noticed the small suitcase on the sidewalk. Here, let me take this for you. He scooped it up. As he passed her in the doorway, he switched on the rear light. My room is in back, he told her. Follow me. She trailed after him in silence. Not quite silence, because Respighi's tone poem still resounded from the radio. As they entered his makeshift living quarters, Sam went over to switch it off. She lifted her hand. Don't, she told him. I'm trying to recognize that music. She nodded. Villa Lobos? Respighi, something called Brazilian Impressions. It's on the Urania label, I believe. Oh, we don't stock that. For the first time, he remembered that Lila worked in a record shop. You want me to leave it on, or do you want to talk, he asked. Turn it off. We'd better talk. He nodded, bent over the set, then faced her. Sit down, he invited. Take off your coat. Thanks. I don't intend to stay long. I've got to find a room. You're here on a visit? Just overnight. I'll probably leave again in the morning. And it isn't exactly a visit. I'm looking for Mary. Looking for... Sam stared at her. But what would she be doing here? I was hoping you could tell me that. But how could I? Mary isn't here. Was she here? Earlier this week, I mean. Of course not. Why, I haven't seen her since she drove up last summer. Sam sat down on the sofa bed. What's the matter, Lila? What's this all about? I wish I knew. 
She avoided his gaze, lowering her lashes and staring at her hands. They twisted in her lap, twisted like serpents. In the bright light, Sam noticed that her hair was almost blonde. She didn't resemble Mary at all now. She was quite another girl. A nervous, unhappy girl. Please, he said. Tell me. Lila looked up suddenly, her wide, hazel eyes searching his. You weren't lying when you said Mary hasn't been here? No, it's the truth. I haven't even heard from her these last few weeks. I was beginning to get worried. Then you come bursting in here and... His voice broke off. Tell me. All right, I believe you. But there isn't much to tell. She took a deep breath and started to speak again, her hands roaming restlessly across the front of her skirt. I haven't seen Mary since a week ago last night at the apartment. That's the night I left for Dallas to see some wholesale suppliers down there. I do the buying for the shop. Anyway, I spent the weekend and took a train back up late Sunday night. I got in early Monday morning. Mary wasn't at the apartment. At first I wasn't concerned. Maybe she'd left early for work. But she usually called me sometime during the day, and when she didn't phone by noon, I decided to call her at the office. Mr. Lowry answered the phone. He said he was just getting ready to call me and see what was wrong. Mary hadn't come in that morning. He hadn't seen or heard from her since the middle of Friday afternoon. Wait a minute, Sam said slowly. Let me get this straight. Are you trying to tell me that Mary has been missing for an entire week? I'm afraid so. Then why wasn't I notified before this? He stood up, feeling the renewed tension in his neck muscles, feeling it in his throat and his voice. Why didn't you get in touch with me? Phone me? What about the police? Sam, I... Instead, you waited all this time and then came up here to ask if I'd seen her. It doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. You see, the police don't know about this, and Mr. Lowry doesn't know about you. After what he told me, I agreed not to call them. But I was so worried, so frightened, and I had to know. That's why, today, I decided to drive up here and find out for myself. I thought maybe the two of you might have planned it together. Planned what? Sam shouted. That's what I'd like to know. The answer was soft, but there was nothing soft about the face of the man who stood in the doorway. He was tall, thin, and deeply tanned. A gray Stetson shadowed his forehead, but not his eyes. The eyes were ice blue and ice hard. Who are you? Sam muttered. How did you get in here? Front door was unlocked, so I just stepped inside. I came here to get a little information, but I see Miss Crane already beat me to the question. Maybe you'd like to give us both an answer now. Answer? That's right. The tall man moved forward, one hand dipping into the pocket of his gray jacket. Sam lifted his arm, then dropped it as the hand came forth extending a wallet. The tall man flipped it open. The name's Arbogast, Milton Arbogast. Licensed investigator representing Parity Mutual. We carry a bonding policy on the Lowry agency your girlfriend worked for. That's why I'm here now. I want to find out what you two did with the $40,000. Chapter 7. The gray Stetson was on the table now, and the gray jacket was draped over the back of one of Sam's chairs. Arbogast snubbed his third cigarette in the ashtray and immediately lighted another. All right, he said. You didn't leave Fairvale any time during the past week. I'll buy that, Loomis. You'd know better than to lie. Too easy for me to check your story around town here. The investigator inhaled slowly. Of course, that doesn't prove Mary Crane hasn't been to see you. She could have sneaked in some evening after your store closed, just like her sister did tonight. Sam sighed. But she didn't. Look, you heard what Lila here just told you. I haven't even heard from Mary for weeks. I wrote her a letter last Friday, the very day she's supposed to have disappeared. Why should I do a thing like that if I knew she was going to come here? To cover up, of course. Very smart move, Arbogast exhaled savagely. Sam rubbed the back of his neck. I'm not that smart. Not that smart at all. I didn't know about the money. The way you've explained it, not even Mr. Lowry knew in advance that somebody was going to bring him $40,000 in cash on Friday afternoon. Certainly Mary didn't know. How could we possibly plan anything together? She could have phoned you from a pay station after she took the money on Friday night and told you to write her. Check with the phone company here, Sam answered wearily. 
You'll find I haven't had any long-distance calls for a month. Arbogast nodded. So she didn't phone you. She drove straight up, told you what had happened, and made a date to meet you later, after things cooled down. Lila bit her lip. My sister's not a criminal. You don't have any right to talk about her that way. You have no real proof that she took the money. Maybe Mr. Lowry took it himself. Maybe he cooked up this whole story just to cover up. Sorry, Arbogast murmured. I know how you feel, but you can't make him your patsy. Unless the thief is found, tried, and convicted, our company doesn't pay off, and Lowry is out of the 40 grand. So he couldn't profit from the deal in any way. Besides, you're overlooking obvious facts. Mary Crane is missing. She has been missing ever since the afternoon she received that money. She didn't take it to the bank. She didn't hide it in the apartment. But it's gone, and her car is gone, and she's gone. Again, a cigarette died and was interred in the ashtray. It all adds up. Lila began to sob softly. No, it doesn't. You should have listened to me when I wanted to call the police. Instead, I let you and Mr. Lowry talk me out of it, because you said you wanted to keep things quiet, and maybe if we waited, Mary would decide to bring the money back. You wouldn't believe what I said, but I know now that I was right. Mary didn't take that money. Somebody must have kidnapped her. Somebody who knew about it. Arbogast shrugged, then rose wearily and walked over to the girl. He patted her shoulder. Listen, Miss Crane, we went through this before, remember? Nobody else knew about the money. Your sister wasn't kidnapped. She went home and packed her bags, drove off in her own car, and she was alone. Didn't your landlady see her off? So be reasonable. I am reasonable. You're the one who doesn't make sense. Following me up here to see Mr. Loomis, the investigator shook his head. What makes you think I followed you? He asked quietly. How else did you happen to come here tonight? You didn't know that Mary and Sam Loomis were engaged. Outside of me, no one knew. You didn't even know Sam Loomis existed. Arbogast shook his head. I knew. Remember up at your apartment when I looked through your sister's desk? I came across this envelope. He flourished it. Why, it's addressed to me, Sam muttered, and rose to reach for it. Arbogast drew his hand away. You won't need this, he said. There's no letter inside, just the envelope. But I can use it because it's in her handwriting. He paused. As a matter of fact, I have been using it ever since Wednesday morning when I started out for here. You started out for here? On Wednesday? Lila dabbed at her eyes with a handkerchief. That's right. I wasn't following you. I was way ahead of you. The address on the envelope gave me a lead. That, plus Loomis's picture in the frame next to your sister's bed. With all my love, Sam. Easy enough to figure out the connection. So I decided to put myself in your sister's place. I've just laid my hands on $40,000 in cash. I've got to get out of town, fast. Where do I go? Canada, Mexico, the West Indies? Too risky. Besides, I haven't had time to make long-range plans. My natural impulses would be to come straight to Loverboy here. Sam hit the kitchen table so hard that the cigarette butts jumped out of the ashtray. That's about enough, he said. You have no official right to make such accusations. So far, you haven't offered one word of proof to back up any of this. Arbogast fumbled for another cigarette. You want proof, eh? What do you think I've been doing back there on the road ever since Wednesday morning? That's when I found the car. You found my sister's car? Lila was on her feet. Sure, I had a funny hunch that one of the first things she'd do would be to ditch it. So I called around town to all the dealers and the used car lots, giving a description and the license number. Sure enough, it paid off. I found the place showed the guy my credentials, and he talked. Talked fast, too. Guess he thought the car was hot. I didn't exactly contradict his notion, either. Turned out that Mary Crane made a fast trade with him on Friday night, just before closing time. Took a hell of a beating on the deal, too. But I got all the info on the title and a full description of the heap she drove out with. Heading north. So I headed north, too. But I couldn't go very fast. I was playing one hunch, that she'd stick to the highway because she was coming here. Probably drive straight through the first night. So I drove straight through for eight hours. Then I spent a lot of time around Oklahoma City, 
checking motels along the highway, and used car places on the road. I figured she might switch again, just to be on the safe side. But no dice. Thursday I got up as far as Tulsa. Same routine, same results. It wasn't until this morning when the needle turned up in the haystack. Another lot, another dealer just north of there. She made the second trade early last Saturday, took another shell acking, and ended up with a blue 1953 Plymouth with a bad front fender. He took a notebook from his pocket. It's all down here in black and white, he said. Title dope, engine number, everything. Both dealers are having photostats made and sending them back to the home office for me. But that doesn't matter now. What matters is that Mary Crane drove north out of Tulsa on the main highway last Saturday morning after switching cars twice in 16 hours. As far as I'm concerned, this is the place she was heading for. And unless something unexpected happened, unless the car broke down, or there was an accident, she should have arrived here last Saturday night. But she didn't, Sam said. I haven't seen her. Look, I can dig up proof if you want it. Last Saturday night, I was over at the Legion Hall playing cards. Plenty of witnesses. Sunday morning, I went to church. Sunday noon, I had dinner at... Arbogast raised a hand wearily. Okay, I get the message. You didn't see her, so something must have happened. I'll start checking back. What about the police? Lila asked. I still think you ought to go to the police. She moistened her lips. Suppose there was an accident. You couldn't stop at every hospital between here and Tulsa. Why, for all we know, Mary may be lying unconscious somewhere right now. She might even be... This time it was Sam who patted her shoulder. Nonsense, he muttered. If anything like that had happened, you'd have been notified by now. Mary's all right. But he glared over Lila's shoulder at the investigator. You can't do a thorough job all alone, he said. Lila's being sensible. Why not let the police in on it? Report Mary missing. See if they can locate her. Arbogast picked up the gray Stetson. We've tried it the hard way so far. I admit it. Because if we could locate her without dragging in the authorities, we might save our client and the company a lot of bad publicity. For that matter, we could save Mary Crane some grief, too, if we picked her up ourselves and recovered the money. Maybe there wouldn't be any charges that way. You've got to agree it was worth. But if you're right, and Mary did get this far, then why hasn't she been to see me? That's what I want to know just as badly as you do, Sam told him, and I'm not going to wait much longer to find out. Will you wait another 24 hours? Arbogast asked. What do you have in mind? More checking, like I said. He raised his hand to forestall Sam's objections. Not all the way back to Tulsa. I admit that's impossible. But I'd like to nose around this territory a bit. Visit the highway restaurants, filling stations, car dealers, motels. Maybe somebody saw her. Because I still think my hunch is right. She intended to come here. Perhaps she changed her mind after she arrived and went on but I'd like to be sure. And if you don't find out in 24 hours, then I'm willing to call it quits, go to the police, do the whole missing persons routine, okay? Sam glanced at Lila. What do you think, he asked. I don't know. I'm so worried now, I can't think. She sighed. Sam, you decide. He nodded at Arbogast. All right, it's a deal, but I'm warning you right now. If nothing happens tomorrow and you don't notify the police, I will. Arbogast put on his jacket. Guess I'll get a room over at the hotel. How about you, Miss Crane? Lila looked at Sam. I'll take her over in a little while, Sam said. First I thought we'd go and eat, but I'll see that she's checked in, and we'll both be here tomorrow, waiting. For the first time that evening, Arbogast smiled. It wasn't the kind of a smile that would ever offer any competition to Mona Lisa, but it was a smile. I believe you, he said. Sorry about the pressure act, but I had to make sure. He nodded at Lila. We're going to find your sister for you. Don't you worry. Then he went out. Long before the front door closed behind him, Lisa was sobbing against Sam's shoulder. Her voice was a muffled moan. Sam, I'm scared. Something's happened to Mary. I know it. It's all right, he said, wondering at the same time why there were no better words why there never are any better words to answer fear and grief and loneliness. It's all right, believe me. Suddenly she stepped away from him, stepped back, and her tear-stained eyes went wide. Her voice went it. 
came, was low but firm. Why should I believe you, Sam? She asked softly. Is there a reason? A reason you didn't tell that inspector? Sam, was Mary here to see you? Did you know about this, about the money? He shook his head. No, I didn't know. You'll have to take my word for that. The way I have to take yours. She turned away, facing the wall. I guess you're right, she told him. Mary could have come to either one of us during the week, couldn't she? But she didn't. I trust you, Sam. Only it's just that it's so hard to believe anything anymore. When your own sister turns out to be a... Take it easy, Sam cut in. What you need right now is a little food and a lot of rest. Things won't look so black tomorrow. Do you really think so, Sam? Yes, I do. It was the first time he'd ever lied to a woman. Chapter 8. Tomorrow became today, Saturday, and for Sam it was a time of waiting. He phoned Lila from the store around 10 and she was already up, had already eaten breakfast. Arbogast wasn't in. Apparently he'd gotten an early start, but he had left a note for Lila downstairs, saying that he would call in sometime during the day. Why don't you come over here and keep me company, Sam suggested over the phone. No sense sitting around in your room. We can have lunch together and check back at the hotel to see if Arbogast calls. Better still, I'll ask the operator to transfer any calls over here to the store. Lila agreed, and Sam felt better. He didn't want her to be alone today. Too easy for her to start brooding about Mary. God knows he'd done enough of it himself all night. He'd done his best to resist the idea, but he had to admit that Arbogast's theory made sense. Mary must have planned to come here after she took the money. If she had taken it, that is. That was the worst part, accepting Mary in the role of a thief. Mary wasn't that kind of a person. Everything he knew about her contradicted the possibility. And yet, just how much did he know about Mary, really? Just last night, he'd acknowledged to himself how little he actually understood his fiancée. Why he knew so little that he'd even mistaken another girl for her, in a dim light. Funny, Sam told himself, how we take it for granted that we know all there is to know about another person, just because we see them frequently, or because of some strong emotional tie. Why, right here in Fairvale, there were plenty of examples of what he meant. Like old Tompkins, superintendent of schools for years, in a big wheel in Rotary, running away from his wife and family with a 16-year-old girl. Whoever suspected he'd do a thing like that? Any more than they'd suspected Mike Fisher, the biggest lush and gambler in this part of the state, would die and leave all his money to the Presbyterian Orphans Home. Bob Summerfield, Sam's clerk in the store, had worked here every day for over a year before Sam knew he'd pulled a Section 8 in service, and for trying to beat out his chaplain's brains with a pistol butt, too. Bob was all right now, of course. A nicer, quieter guy you wouldn't find in a hundred years. But he'd been nice and quiet in the Army, too, until something set him off, and nobody had noticed. Nice old ladies did away with their husbands after twenty years of happy marriage, Meek little bank clerks suddenly up and embezzled the funds. You never could tell what might happen. So perhaps Mary did steal the money. Perhaps she was tired of waiting for him to pay off his debts, and the sudden temptation was just too much. Maybe she thought she'd bring it here, cook up some story, get him to accept it. Maybe she planned for them to run away together. He had to be honest about the possibility, even the probability, that this was the case. And if he granted that much, then he had to face the next question. Why hadn't she arrived? Where else could she have headed for after leaving the outskirts of Tulsa? Once you began speculation about that, once you admitted to yourself that you didn't really know how another person's mind operated, then you came up against the ultimate admission. Anything was possible. A decision to take a wild fling out in Las Vegas. A sudden impulse to drop out of sight completely and start a whole new life under another name, a traumatic access of guilt resulting in amnesia. But he was beginning to make a federal case out of it, Sam told himself wryly, or a clinical case. If he was going off on such far-fetched speculations, he'd have to admit a thousand and one other alternatives. That she had been in an accident, as Lila feared, or picked up some hitchhiker who, again, Sam closed off the thought. He couldn't afford to carry it any further. It was bad enough keeping it to himself without the added burden of keeping it from Lila. His job today was to cheer her up. 
there was always the slim chance that Arbogast would find a lead. If not, he'd go to the authorities. Then, and only then, would he allow himself to think about the worst that might happen. Talk about not knowing other people. Why, when you came right down to it, you didn't even know yourself. He'd never suspected that he could entertain such sudden doubt and disloyalty concerning Mary. And yet how easily he'd slipped into accepting the attitude. It was unfair to her. The least he could do, in partial atonement, was to keep his suspicions from her sister. Unless, of course, she was thinking the same things. But Lila seemed in better spirits this morning. She'd changed into a lightweight suit, and when she came into the store, her step was buoyant. Sam introduced her to Bob Summerfield, then took her out to lunch. Inevitably, she began speculating about Mary and about what Arbogast might be doing today. Sam answered her briefly, attempting to keep both his replies and his tone of voice on a casual level. After their meal, he stopped at the hotel and arranged to have a transfer made on any calls which might come in for Lila during the afternoon. Then they went back to the store. It was a light day for Saturday, and much of the time Sam was able to sit in the back room and chat with the girl. Summerfield handled the customers, and it was only occasionally that Sam had to excuse himself and step out to take care of matters. Lila seemed relaxed and at ease. She switched on the radio, picked up a symphonic program on AM, and listened with apparent absorption. Sam found her sitting there when he returned from one of his trips up front. Bartok's concerto for orchestra, isn't it? He asked. She looked up, smiling. That's right. Funny you're knowing so much about music. What's so strange about that? This is the age of hi-fi, remember? Just because a person lives in a small town doesn't mean he can't be interested in music, books, art, and I've had a lot of time to fill. Lila smoothed the collar of her blouse. Maybe I've got things backwards then. Maybe the funny thing isn't that you're interested in things like this, but that you're also in the hardware business. The two just don't seem to go together. There's nothing wrong with the hardware business. I didn't mean to imply that, but it seems, well, so trivial. Sam sat down at the table. Suddenly, he stopped and picked up an object from the floor. It was small, pointed, and shiny. Trivial, he echoed. Perhaps. Then again, maybe it's all in the way you look at it. For example, what's this in my hand? A nail, isn't it? That's right, just a nail. I sell them by the pound. Hundreds of pounds a year. Dad used to sell them, too. I'll bet we've sold ten tons of nails out of this store alone since it opened for business. All lengths, all sizes, just common ordinary nails. But there's nothing trivial about a single one of them. Not when you stop to think about it. Because every nail serves a purpose. An important, a lasting purpose. You know something? Maybe half the frame houses in Fairvale are held together by nails we've sold right here. I guess it's a little silly of me. But sometimes when I walk down the street here in town, I get the feeling that I helped build it. The tools I sold shape the boards and finish them. I've provided the paint that covers the houses, the brushes which applied it, the storm doors and screens, the glass for the windows. He broke off with a self-conscious grin. Listen to the master builder, will you? But no, I mean it. Everything in this business makes sense because it serves a real purpose, fills a need that's a part of living. Even a single nail like this one fulfills a function. Drive it into a crucial place and you can depend on it to do a job. Keep on doing it for a hundred years to come. Long after we're dead and gone, both of us. The moment he said the words, he regretted them. But it was too late now. He watched the smile fade from her lips as if on cue. Sam, I'm worried. It's almost four now, and Arbogast hasn't called. He will. Just be patient. Give him time. I can't help it. You said 24 hours, and then you'd go to the police if you had to. I meant it, but it won't be 24 hours until 8 o'clock. And I still say maybe we won't have to go. Maybe Arbogast is right. Maybe. Sam, I want to know. She smoothed her blouse again, but her brow remained wrinkled. You aren't fooling me for one minute with all this routine about nails. You're just as nervous as I am, aren't you? Yes, I guess so. He stood up, swinging his arms. I don't know why Arbogast hasn't called in by now. There aren't that many places in this area to check. Not if he stopped at every highway hamburger joint and motel in the county. If he doesn't get in touch with us by supper time, 
I'll go over to Judd Chambers myself. Who? Judd Chambers. He's the sheriff here. Fairvale's the county seat, you know. Sam, I... The phone rang, out in the store. He disappeared without waiting for her to complete her sentence. Bob Summerfield was already answering. It's for you, he called. Sam picked up the receiver, glancing over his shoulder and noting that Lila had followed him out. Hello, Sam Loomis speaking. Arbogast, thought you might be worried about me. We were. Lila and I have been sitting here and waiting for you to call. What did you find out? There was a short, almost imperceptible pause then. No dice so far. So far? Where have you been all day? Where haven't I been? I've covered this area from one end to another. Right now I'm in Parnassus. That's way down at the edge of the county, isn't it? What about the highway between? I came out on it, but I understand I can come back another way. On an alternate. Yes, that's right. The old highway, it's a county trunk now, but there's absolutely nothing along that route. Not even a filling station. Fellow in the restaurant here tells me there's a motel back in through there. Oh, come to think of it, I guess there is. The old Bates place. I didn't know it was still open. It isn't likely you'll find anything there. Well, it's the last on the list. I'm coming back anyway, so I might as well stop in. How you holding? All right. And the girl? Sam lowered his voice. She wants me to notify the authorities immediately. And I think she's right. After what you've told me, I know she's right. Will you wait until I get there? How long is it going to take? An hour, maybe, unless I run into something at this motel. Arbogast hesitated. Look, we made a bargain. I'm willing to keep my end of it. All I'm asking is for you to wait until I come back to town. Let me go with you to the police. It'll be a lot easier to get cooperation that way with me along. You know how it is with small-town law. The minute you ask them to put through a long-distance call, they press the panic button. We'll give you an hour, Sam said. You can find us here at the store. He hung up and turned away. What did he say? Lila asked. He didn't find out anything, did he? Well, no, but he isn't finished yet. There's another place where he plans to stop. Only one more place? Don't say it like that. Maybe he'll hear something there. If not, he's due back within an hour. We'll go to the sheriff. You heard what I told him. All right, we'll wait. One hour, you said. It wasn't a pleasant hour. Sam was almost grateful when the late Saturday afternoon crowd came in and he had an excuse to go out front and help wait on the overflow. He couldn't pretend to be cheerful any longer, couldn't make small talk, not to her nor to himself, because he was beginning to feel it now. Something had happened. Something had happened to Mary. Something... Sam! He turned away from the cash register after completing a sale, and Lila was there. She'd come out from the back room, and she was pointing at her wristwatch. Sam, the hour's up. I know. Let's give him a few more minutes, shall we? I've got to close up the store first anyway. All right, but only a few minutes, please. If you knew how I felt, I do know. He squeezed her arm squeezed out a smile. Don't worry, he'll be here any second. But he didn't come. Sam and Summerfield shoot out the last straggler at 5.30. Sam checked the register and Summerfield spread the dust covers for the night. Still, Arbogast didn't appear. Summerfield switched off the lights, prepared to depart. Sam got ready to lock the door. No Arbogast, now, Lila said. Let's go now. If you don't, then I w Listen, Sam said. It's the phone. And seconds later, hello? Arbogast, where are you? You promised to... Never mind what I promised. The investigator's voice was low, his words hurried. I'm out at the motel and I've only got a minute. Wanted to let you know why I hadn't showed. Listen, I've found a lead. Your girlfriend was here all right. Last Saturday night. Mary? You're sure? Pretty sure. I checked the register. Got a chance to compare handwriting. Of course, she used another name, Jane Wilson, and gave a phony address. I'll have to get a court order to photostat the register entry. If we need proof. What else did you find out? Well, the car description tallies, and so does the description of the girl. The proprietor filled me in. How'd you manage to get that information? 
I pulled my badge and gave him the stolen car routine. He got all excited. A real oddball, this guy. Name's Norman Bates. You know him? No, I can't say that I do. He says the girl drove in Saturday night around 6, paid in advance. It was a bad night, raining, and she was the only customer. Claims she pulled out early the next morning, before he came down to open up. He lives in a house behind the motel with his mother. Do you think he's telling the truth? I don't know yet. What does that mean? Well, I put a little heat on him, about the car and all, and he let it slip that he'd invited the girl up to the house for supper. Said that was all there was to it. His mother could verify it. Did you talk to her? No, but I'm going to. She's up at the house in her room. He tried to hand me a line that she's too sick to see anyone, but I noticed her sitting at the bedroom window, giving me the once-over when I drove in. So I told him I was going to have a little chat with his old lady, whether he liked it or not. But you have no authority. Look, you want to find out about your girlfriend, don't you? And he doesn't seem to know anything about search warrants. Anyway, he hot-footed it off to the house to tell his mother to get dressed. I thought I'd sneak through a call while he's gone. So you stick around until I'm finished here. Oh, oh, he's coming back. See you. The receiver clicked and the line went dead. Sam hung up. He turned to Lila and reported the conversation. Feel better now? Yes, but I wish I knew. We will know in just a little while. Now all we have to do is wait.